Well, the stars blazed bright, showed brave men the way. Under guns by night is where they'd lay. With a land so old and harsh, much to be uncovered. These stories we will tell on Australia rediscovered. Come here about it all with Rico. On Australia rediscovered. Oh, there you go, the magnificent Tony Cook at it again, providing us with our intro music. Thank you, Tony. Dingo Dave, it wouldn't be a podcast. Wouldn't be a podcast without you, old mate. How are you going? Thank you very much, mate. Oh, I'm good. I'm uh, down in the national capital at the moment. Sounds terrible. And, um, yeah, got a bit of wear. Well, it's a good time to be here, no one here. Yep. <laughs> it's a bit quiet, a bit quiet in Canberra. Uh, yeah, a bit of work coming back, which is nice. Um, starting to get back to a bit of normalcy, which is fantastic. Uh, good to see, good to see. All right, mate, well, uh, this week's podcast, we are going to do one of the most famous names in Australia, in, in terms of exploration at least. Uh, his name is Frederick Wilhelm Ludwig Leichhardt. Absolutely, mate. He is all over the place. I literally drove on the Leichhardt Highway yesterday. So well, there you there go. You go. All right, and coming up later in this uh, this episode of this podcast, we have a very special guest. I'm really excited about this. We are going to be talking to an off-road legend here in Australia, someone who's been doing this sort of stuff a hell of a lot longer than me and probably a lot longer than you as well, Dingo. Uh, Absolutely. I am talking about Mr. Ron Moon from 4x4 Australia and various other books, publications, videos and things over the years. Um He's been a massive inspiration to me and many others, so we're really looking forward to hearing from him. And he's going to talk to us about some of the places that you can go to experience what Leichhardt experienced. Yeah, that's so cool. Like Ron was definitely an inspiration for me, you know, hands down. So yeah, it's been a it's been a while since I've actually seen Ron. I've, I've come across him on a few different Four by Four Australia trips over the years, but um, looking forward to having a chat. Should be good. Yeah, you know, last last episode we did uh, Sturt, and you know, his great great grandfather was on that expedition. On. Which, on sorry, the, on the Ron's Sturt. great-great-grandfather. Yeah, Ron's great-great-grandfather was on the Sturt expedition. He was the guy looking after ah. the massive whaling boat that didn't really see much action. Sensational. I had no idea. That's yeah. so cool. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> so the, <laughs> the adventurer and explorer gene is still going strong in Ron. Absolutely. That's what Fantastic. we like. Or and I see um, his, sorry? his son's also doing a bit of touring now too, I see. Yeah, Trent's doing a fair bit. They um, do tours of their own as well, tag along tours yeah, and things like that. Yeah, Moon so, Tours, I, I follow their Facebook page. So, yeah, um, jump on there yeah. and have a squiz. It's, uh, they do some cool stuff. All right, back to Leichhardt. So um, Leichhardt was an explorer, and I think he was probably more of an explorer in the traditional mould compared to Charles Sturt, who we covered last time. And I tell you what, this is a bloke who knew some stuff. He lived for education and knowledge and just learning for the love of learning. Much like my Absolutely. <laughs> I, I, I definitely put you two in the same category, mate. Yeah. Uh, look, Leichhardt's, Leichhardt's journals were amazing. You know, you can actually go online to the ANU website and actually find his journals there and see ANU have done a very clever job of actually comparing the journals on every given day for the other people in the party and then also of the people who were retracing the, 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 jo- the journey 100 years later. So he was a prolific note taker. Um, and you could literally go and find those campsites now just based on his descriptions out of his journals. So fantastic. Yeah, yeah I've so read much a, detail. I've read a bunch of his journals, and I've also read a few books about him, and obviously there's all the stuff online as well. And, yeah, he was he was very um, – what's the word I'm looking for here? Very precise at taking notes and so on. Like very, very well um, – disciplined in that regard you know when you think about all the things you've got to deal with when you're out there in those situations he he didn't miss a thing that's it and he approached it with science you know he, the the point of science is that people behind you can come and do it again yeah. um and that's exactly what he did you know his his journaling his his uh the way that they like they were sort of botanical drawings and various other things along the way were all very scientifically done yeah, yeah. it's amazing all right well let's talk a little bit about where Leichhardt came from he was born in a place that Technically, doesn't exist anymore. A country called Prussia. I, I had I've heard of the Franco-Prussian Wars, but I've got to be honest. Until I looked this up, I didn't know what or where Prussia actually was. But uh, I've since learned that it is now part of Germany. So he was born in Prussia in 1813 in a village called Trebach, which is now known as Torche. If you're a bit of a map fiend like me, I, I read these things and then I want to go to the map and look up where they actually are, just to get a an idea of where they come from. 
and he was the sixth of eight children. His father, Christian, was a farmer. And get this, I, I spent a bit of time looking into this. He was also a royal inspector of peat. I cannot for the life of me figure out what a royal inspector of peat is. And it's P-E-A-T, not Pete the bloke. Now, I know what Pete, Pete and peat bog is and all that sort of stuff, but I can't imagine that there's a position exists called the royal inspector of said dirt. The Prussians took their peat very seriously, <laughs> mate. <laughs> yeah, if anyone else can uh, shed any light on that, I'd love to know what that job entailed because that, that just sounds uh, it sounds really fancy, but not at the same time. <laughs> One of those token royal positions. <laughs> yeah, perhaps, perhaps. Oh, God. Now, as we said earlier, he, this, this is a dude who was massive on education and learning and the pursuit of knowledge. Now, he studied philosophy, languages, and natural sciences, including geology, botany, zoology, ethology, and quite a few more. But this is some serious heavy-duty learning. Like just to take one of those subjects alone is pretty full-on, eh? Absolutely. You know, many explorations had, you know, one person who specialised in botany, one person who did rocks, one person who did stars. You know, this guy sort of uh, did it all. Um, yeah. He, he really was, but as you said, he was an explorer in that true sense that he... he had a massive love of learning and a massive love of educating others. Um, and clearly, you know, he, he enjoyed challenging himself to learn a bit of stuff as well. So, yeah. Well, in, yeah. The, in the brain space side of things, he was certainly well equipped for the journeys that were to come, that's for sure. Probably better equipped than, than most others. Geology is one of those subjects I wish I'd paid more attention to in school. You know, when you're out in these amazing places in Central Australia, and you and I have had these conversations on the road. We have, mate. We have. Um, you know, just about the geology of the area and the rocks and the rock formations, and it intrigues me. It's something I really need to put some more time into one day. I do love my rocks. <laughs> so he, he was educated at a couple of different universities, one in Gottingen and one in Berlin, but he never actually graduated nor received a degree. He moved to England in 1837 with a schoolmate, a bloke by the name of William Nicholson, and that'll become important later on. And between 1837 and 1842, he, again, studied more and more, and this time more in the medical side of things as well. So talk about taking another huge bite out of things. And, of course, more natural science. He studied at the Royal College of Surgeons, the British Museum, and also in France at, at the Jardin des Plantes. So I think it's a well garden, garden of plants, something, <laughs> something like that. So. And during this time, he also completed field observations in England, France, Italy, and Switzerland. So by the time he you know, decided that he wanted to come to Australia, he'd done a fair bit, hadn't he? Absolutely. He'd, he'd certainly earned his credentials even without ever actually uh, qualifying or, if you like, finishing all, um, his university studies. Yeah, that's right. So uh, he wanted to come to Australia to continue to study natural sciences. And his mate, William, who we spoke about earlier, William Nicholson, he paid his fare... And he also provided clothes, gear, and 200 pounds, which, if you take inflation into account, is roughly about 20 grand today. So his mate's going, here's 20 grand, here's your fare, here's all the gear you're going to need, off you go, old mate. You're a clever boy, go get yourself set up. That, it's really quite something, isn't it? Yeah, oh, it's, it's hard to imagine something like that happening today, that's for sure. That's a, that's a nice gift. Now, as we said, Leichhardt's a bloke who pursued knowledge for its own sake, he, just for the joy of learning. And he actually stopped following a regular syllabus, you know, quite a few years earlier. And he learnt just for the pure sake and the joy of learning. Even though we said he's never been bestowed any formal qualifications, his mates thought enough of him to address him as doctor, just purely in recognition of his dedication to the pursuit of knowledge. I might insist that, that you and the other boys on the on the crew start calling me Dr. Rico. Well, we've had a few names for you over the years. So I'm not sure that was ever one of them. Nothing quite that complimentary, no. <laughs> Dr. Rico, yeah. Dr. Rico. Not going to happen. Probably. So, <laughs> Leichhardt arrived in Australia aboard the ship the Sir Edward Paget in February of 1842, uh, like we said, with a view to exploring inland Australia. So, he knew what he was coming for and what he was going to get himself into. Now, I reckon going to explore inland Australia in you know the 1840s, is a completely different kettle of fish to doing some field observ field observations in you know well established populated European countries like Italy and Switzerland and those sort of things. That's um, it. Italy, I, France, Germany. Walk any direction for an hour, you're going to bump into someone, aren't you? You've got to <laughs> wonder if you knew what he was in for, don't you? Oh yeah, you've got to wonder what what must the what must the myths and the stories that have been told back in Europe been from from those early people who really had had managed to come to Australia, see very little, and then return. Yeah, that's right. No one had been out there yet. 
it's funny because I, I, there were a lot of Germans or, or Prussians back then, I suppose, that got into that sort of side of things when they came over to Australia. If you look at um, the Burke and Wills expedition, for instance, there mm-hmm. were quite a few Germans or, or Prussians. I'm just going to call them Germans for, for simplicity's sake on those expeditions. And again, these are all really intelligent, clever, very learned men. Mm-hmm. I wonder what it was back then that, that made them that way. Yeah, I don't know. That'll be interesting to find out. That's a, What was the motivation of, of Prussians to study a lot and get out of Germany? <laughs> yeah, well, that's right. All, all the bad stuff hadn't happened yet, had it? So. <laughs> all right, so um, once he'd arrived in Australia, he'd set himself up. He spent six months or so conducting studies in and around Sydney and doing lectures on botany and geology and, and all those sort of things. He Basically, he was establishing his credentials, so... He was kind of half hoping that the governor at the time, it was Governor Gipps, uh, Mount Gipps out near Broken Hills, named after him, just out of curiosity. He was hoping that he would establish a museum, a recognised institution that perhaps Leichhardt could be appointed the curator of, because that's uh, that's the sort of gig that he saw himself doing. And, you know, as the curator, he could go out there and collect these samples and do these things. And obviously that didn't happen. No, he did plenty of getting out there and collecting samples. And it's not like he had a... Um it's not like he had a place to bring him back to that was all his own. No, that's right. So in September 1842, he decided to go up to the Hunter River Valley, where, again, further studies, including geology, flora, fauna, all of the things we've spoken about. And he also observed some of the farming methods that were going on up there at the time as well. And I think all of all of this stuff that he's done up until this point has come in real handy later on. During this time, he also decided to go from Newcastle, the Hunter Valley region, up to Moreton Bay District. And he did these journeys alone. So these overland journeys, and, and this was to provide great training for what was to come, really, wasn't it? Like We, we say that he's gone and done this great big epic journey as his first thing, but all of these little journeys put together, you know, and Newcastle to, you know, the Moreton Bay area is not just a hop, skip and a jump. No, even today, that's, that's, not, a, that's not a little trip. Um, and to sort of head off on your own as part of a specimen collecting journey, you know, that's that's a big deal because you, know, you get there and you're only halfway. You know, you've still got to bring all those things home again. So That's right. You, know, you end up going through a, places a, like the Warren Bungles and beautiful places. Imagine the look on his face when he's first seen those formations up there in the Warren Bungles and the Pilliger oh, region. Oh, absolutely, yeah. That must have been mind-blowing. So from May to July in 1844, Leichhardt was back in Sydney and he was arranging his collections of plants and rocks and specimens and working on the notes of his observations of the geology and and all of those things in the places that he'd been. He was hoping to accompany an overland expedition from Sydney to Port Essington. Now, Port Essington, for those who don't know, is basically the very, very top of the Northern Territory, uh, slightly east of Darwin. Now, there was a port set up there for trading vessels, English trading vessels, to stop and, you know, resupply and, and do all of those sort of things. And I'll tell you what, it's a tough country out there. Oh, the, the the vision I've seen of what that um, community was like, you know, and the yeah. the ridiculous temperatures and the how how remote they were, and there were people up there with their families. Like it wasn't just a military outpost; it was actually a yep. you know, it was an Australian outpost. And, no, literally um, yeah, thousands that, of kilometres from anyone else. Oh, tough gig, tough gig. Now the the people that uh, have a say over these things, they recommended that the Surveyor General, Sir Thomas Mitchell, should be the bloke who led this trip. Now, the governor, he, he wasn't so keen on uh, sanctioning such a thing without the consent of the colonial office back in, in England because, let's face it, it's a massive expense. It's So many things could go wrong. So he wasn't prepared to make that decision. This sort of gave Ludwig the opportunity to do it himself. So yeah. he wanted to be a part of that trip with Sir Thomas Mitchell. But, yeah, it didn't happen. Nope, so he did it himself. So what he's done, he's uh, he's gone around and decided that he'd go and see some sponsors and, and raise the coin himself and, and lead the expedition and have it um, manned by volunteers just to keep the cost down and things like that. So six of them, including himself, sailed from Sydney in August 1844. Uh, once they re- arrived at the Moreton Bay District, four more of them joined the expedition and they left Jimbor, which is the furthest outpost of the settlement on the Darling, in October. Two of the party turned back pretty quickly, and on the 28th of June, 1845, the ornithologist, you know, you know what an ornithologist is? Somebody who likes birds. Yeah, bird guy. Uh, yeah. Someone who studies birds. John Gilbert, he was killed and at, in an attack on Leichhardt's camp by Aborigines, and one of the other blokes was, um, I think it was Roper, was was also injured with a spear to the groin. Now, Jimbo Homestead, Rico, is still there, uh, just oh, yeah? outside the town of Dolby. Fascinating. You, you can... You can rent it for massive functions, weddings, and all sorts of things. It is. Um, How cool is that? It, it's part of. 
I don't know if it's national trust, but it is certainly part of a, a, a prolonged sort of care program. We actually visited there a couple of years ago uh, on our Dugger Derby, as it happens. And um, yeah, a, a amazing building and, and you can check it all out. You can go inside and see it all, all the outbuildings, the gardens are absolutely um, magnificent. So that little bit of history is still there, 20 k's outside of Dolby, and it is immaculately well kept. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, so we said, yeah, one of them was killed by a spear, the other one copped one to the groin. That's going to ruin your day. Monuments to Gilbert can be found at St. St. James Church in Sydney, and also the Gilbert's Lookout at Tarim, which is directly west of where you live in Harvey Bay. Yep, pretty much. Yes, very nice. There's also Leichhardt's trees out there too, I believe. Leichhardt's tree, I didn't know about that one, so there we yeah. go. Yeah, same Tarim. place, or similar place, out at Tarim anyway. Oh, cool. Well, anyway, the, the journey continued, and the remaining seven finally reached Port Essington in December of 1845, completing a journey of nearly 5,000 kilometres. Now, it had taken them 13 months and along the way, they obviously named lots and lots of places. One of the most famous is the the mighty Roper River up there in the Northern Territory, named after mm-hmm. poor old John Roper, who copped a spear and a groin. They returned on a ship called the Heroine, and Leichhardt arrived back in Sydney in March of 1846. It was believed that his party had perished, and their unexpected success was just massive in Sydney. So they hailed him the Prince of Explorers. Maybe I'm going to change my name from Dr. Rico to the Prince of Explorers. To the Prince. Prince Rico. Yeah, the Fresh Prince. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and subsequently, they became national heroes, these blokes, as you would expect, because that was a massive journey. They received some, some coin from the government and also from sponsors as well. And when you added it all up, in today's money, it was well over a quarter of a million bucks. So very well paid for his 13 months of, uh, well, in the term they would have used in the date was privations. Mm. We, we call it hardship and suffering these days because nobody uses that terminology anymore, which is a shame. When you read, oh, those, uh, when you read the journals and, <laughs> and Burke and Will's stuff and, and all of the newspaper articles and things like that, the language they used back then was just awesome. Oh, it is. Like you read through the journal and, you know, and, and uh, I, there's one page, and when we get to Burke and Will's, I'll have to find that page that, um, like, they'd had just the worst possible day. Like, it, everything, you know, in in, a, in the Burke and Wills framework anyway. And yet the, the language with which they wrote and recorded their day was still so... <laughs> Proper. You know, it was almost poetic. And yet you're sort of reading through these events that were just so bad. And it's like, oh, my God, how are you writing it that way? <laughs> and the same thing, um, again, with, with Ludwig. His, his journaling was scientific, but yet colourful. You know, there are days where he would actually just talk about the and, and praise if you like the landscape that he'd walked through yep so it certainly wasn't just a, a chore it, it it was certainly a passion the whole way through yeah look i i really lament the loss of all of that language and those words and things like that because uh, even though i probably sound a bit bogan myself I, I love that sort of language i'm sure you did your best to bring it back during the homeschooling phase mate that was... yeah yeah i brought up <laughs> privations and things like that and i was met with blank stares as i was most days with most things oh you did your best yeah, well, they can go back on Monday. Happy days. All right. So after he got back, he obviously spent a fair bit of time recovering and, and getting well because they all suffered pretty badly, particularly towards the end. Things were pretty tough going there. There was a mm. you know close to starvation and, and all of those sorts of things. But he spent that time preparing his journal from that expedition for publication in England. And this was massive. This, this was massive. These are the things that cemented you as an explorer and cemented your position amongst those people. So when you want to go and do more stuff later on, they take you a little bit more seriously. This is it. It's, it's like your resume, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's a different way of doing things, but that's the way they all did it. In the meantime, he gave lectures on geology, botany, natural history, and what he called the capabilities of the country between Moreton Bay and Port Essington, i.e. is it suitable for farming, is it suitable for livestock, and all of those sorts of things. I really enjoyed his method. Sorry, Rick, I really right. enjoyed his method of staying always with or very close to the headwaters of the rivers and creeks. That yep. He basically mapped, if you follow sort of the journey, you'll see that he was never that far from places where water could be obtained. So as far as opening up the land, like walking across the desert opens up the land, but it doesn't tell you that it's much good for, for growing crops or, or for farming. He really was leaving, if you like, the, the data behind for people who did want to open up the land to, to grazing or to farming uh, to, to know, if you like, where all of those waters reached to. He, he sort of traced the headwater of, of massive, massive river systems all the way through. So it was very cleverly done. Yeah, well, look, that's, that's why he became a bit of a legend in that field, I guess. And, uh, 
yeah. like you said, he made it easier for those who came after him, which is very, very good. Now, he got his uh, his journals in order. He sorted all of that out. I think he won a few medals as a result of all that as well. He did. All the while, he was planning his next expedition. So he wanted to go and do this um, this one where he crossed Australia from Darling Downs to the west coast of Australia. Like This is, talk about your most epic adventures of all time. And then Absolutely. follow the coast down to the Swan River settlement, which is uh, what we know as Perth today. So that that's pretty huge. Now, how would they go up to two to three years, I believe? So, yeah. the just the, the the concept of heading bush with everything you're going to take with you, <laughs> and knowing that, and knowing that at minimum this is two to three year um, expedition with no way to contact people. You know, really, once they. Once they moved through the Darling Downs, there was no more regular contact with the person, yeah, you know, or, right. or with the person who could report back or give them news. Really, quite an outstanding level of commitment and planning. Yeah, given his success with the first expedition up to Port Essington, you know, he'd published his journals, he'd done everything he needed to do. The result of that meant that he actually got some funding from the government this time. So he still tipped in a fair bit of his own cash, probably close to a couple of hundred grand, getting everything ready. But the government also kicked the can as well, which made life a little bit easier for him. Uh, in December 1846, his party of eight, including himself, they set out from the Darling Downs. Turns out that they were delayed by some pretty heavy rain and you know animals being taken for food by the blacks and the straying of animals, all of these sorts of things. Eventually, they were weakened by fever and they were forced, after only covering about 800 k's, to return, which is uh, just bizarre considering they were gone for six months, they did 800 k's. Previously, in 13 months, they'd done 5,000, so the going must have been pretty tough. Must have been rugged. So he examined the course of the Condamine River on that on that well he started to anyway on the on that journey and after a bit of a rest they spent another six weeks just following that river and they also explored the country between there and a route that Thomas Mitchell had taken earlier as well. So they weren't just sitting around. He only in essence had a couple of weeks off, which is pretty epic considering the hardships they've been through over the six months. All right, so in eighteen forty eight he again set out the go from the Condamine River to reach the Swan River. Now, his theory was that he was going to do a big arc across the top of the country and skirted sort of the outside of all the desert country to, to avoid all that nastiness. The expedition consisted of Leichhardt, four Europeans, two Aboriginal guides, seven horses, 20 mules, and 50 bullocks. That'd be some work in itself, wouldn't it? Just That's it. Eight people. What was it? Wrangling six, the animals. Six, eight people. Yeah, just, just the effort that went into just moving those animals across that sort of um, <laughs> unknown. Like, you don't even know what you're walking into, and yet you've taken a small farm with you. Um, really quite, yeah, I, I guess. But again, here's another example of how, you know, seriously this man took it. He only took a small group of people. Like, there wasn't there wasn't the fanfare of 20 and 30 people like we saw in some of the, some of the other exploratory groups. Yeah, that's um, right. He did. He had a small but specialised group. Well, that twenty mules and fifty bullocks had to carry enough gear to last for the next two to three years as well. So they certainly would have had their Incredible. hands full. Had a couple of Aboriginal guides there as well, and I, I think Aboriginal guides. And we said this last time with Sturt. These guys are unsung heroes, aren't they? They they provide sure. so much to these expeditions, and I don't think they get anywhere near the recognition they deserve. No, agreed. And and for many, like at least. Uh, at least in this case, it, it was well known that he did. And certainly on that first trip, the assistance provided by them was well recognised. There were some locations named after them. Whereas in, in many cases, it was just sort of, you know, they were the Aboriginals that accompanied them and they were almost nameless and faceless. But, yeah. you know, well, I, I do like that with the... No, was, they were not. There was Womai and Billy Bombat. That's, Fantastic. That's their name. And they both come from the Port Stephens region, which is a beautiful part of the world. All right, so they've set off on this epic, epic adventure, and they were last seen on the 3rd of April in 1848 at Alan McPherson's station called Kogoon on the Darling Downs. So basically, they started heading inland and were never seen again, which is just uh, horrible. Horrible. Uh, uh, yeah, and, and for how long How long did it take before people realised they weren't popping out the other side? <laughs> yeah, that's right. You know, if, if they'd said, you know, we'll see you in three years, it wasn't like people went looking six months later. So. But there are lots of theories, Rico. There's lots of theories about where, well, which way they went, first of all, and then where it was that they met their demise. Well, there's a couple of theories, as you said. One suggests that uh, they died somewhere in the Great Sandy Desert in the Australian interior. There is another story where they were slaughtered just west of the Mar- Maranoa River, and then articles from the expedition were widely traded, and that's how they've ended up in places as far west as the Great Sandy Desert. But the truth is, we'll never know. One day I'd love to mount an expedition to go out there and try and find out the truth, but being a, 
a doctor and a prince of explorers, I'm I'm sure we go all right. <laughs> oh yeah, we'd we'd totally nail it. It's um <laughs> yeah, there's there's the the oral history, I guess, of Aboriginals in places that really had no reason to have seen a uh, caravan of white men with a whole heap of animals who you know have evidence in their oral history of these people passing through that area sort of does throw a lot of the original planned route into a little bit of um, into a little bit of doubt also which just then opens up the entire continent like which which yeah, way right. did well, they Well there go? are there is evidence of cave paintings in central Australia depicting exactly that scene and yeah, as you said yeah. otherwise how would they have seen something like that you know you can there's word of mouth but actually painting a picture based on that can probably be a little tricky so you'd have to think they at least got halfway. Yeah, yeah, and I think um, certainly uh, the sources I've been reading seem to suggest that they did make it sort of uh, across into at least the Northern Territory. The the two or three little, I guess, theories line up with that, and then from there there's a divergence of whether they, which way they went um, in that respect. But yeah, the the number of uh, oh, elements of the party. Um, what's the word I'm looking for, mate? When you you leave Artifacts. something behind. Artifacts, thank you. That's an awesome word. This is why you're the professor. Um, doctor, doctor, thank you. <laughs> so <laughs> um, the number of artifacts that were found, and, and they're legit. You know, These artifacts have been checked by the ANU, and they match. Everything is correct. So the fact that these artifacts have actually ended up in vi- like such widely disparate locations on the, uh, on the continent, it's really, it, it doesn't help us, does it? It doesn't help us <laughs> solve the problem. Well, I'll tell you who is launching an expedition to go and try and get to the bottom of this. Larry Perkins, the V8 supercar race driver. Really? Yeah, he he has a massive fascination amongst this stuff, and uh, I can't say I blame him. So hopefully That's he comes excellent. up with some answers. Fantastic. Well, well, let's let's have a look at some of the facts about um, where he did get to at least. So, four years after his disappearance, the government of New South Wales sent out a search party under a bloke named Hovenden Healy. They found nothing but a single campsite with a tree marked L over XVA. So that would be the number of the camp. So they'd obviously camped quite a, a few times by the time they'd gotten to this point. In 1858, another expedition was sent out, this un- time under uh, a pretty well-known explorer named Augustus Gregory in uh, April. Mm-hmm. He, yeah, what is now Blackall, near, near the Barker River in Queensland, he also found a tree marked L. In 1864, Duncan McIntyre discovered two trees marked with L on the Flinders River near the Gulf of Carpentaria. So there were quite a few around, and it, and it suggests that he was heading north by northwest on his route, which, as we said earlier, would have him skirting all of the inland of Australia and staying near those headwaters and, and doing what we'd said earlier. That's um, right, avoiding all of the... You know, going where he knew there was water, you know, so getting yeah, away right. from that arid reason. So apart uh, from those two trees way. that he found, uh, which he estimated to be about 15 years old, they found no further trace. You know, the mystery of his fate was front of mind for explorers for years and years to come. You know, every time someone went out, they they always had that in the back of their mind. David Carnegie, another explorer, his expedition through the Gibson and the Great Sandy Deserts in 1896, he encountered some Aborigines who had amongst their possessions an iron tent peg, the lid of a tin matchbox, and part of the ironwork of a saddle, which, as you said, had all been checked to be legit and they can confirm that they come from that expedition. Now, the Gibson and the Great Sandy Deserts are a long, long, long way from the Darling Downs and a long way from these trees that had been marked as well. So obviously Carnegie thought that they were from the expedition and with the exception of a small brass plate, which we'll, we'll talk about in a minute, no other artefacts with corroborated evidence have been able to shed light on where he went and where he ended up. Yeah, it's, it's, it really is just boggling that, well, firstly, how do you go and find two L's marked on a tree? You know, you're, you're looking in an entire continent and yeah. you're finding that's, the, you know... The, the needle in the haystack. Oh, it is really quite incredible that, and again, another story of the search parties also opening up land. You know, the search parties were not just there to yep. to find people. They conducted science too and they made new discoveries. And, you know, to have found those two blaze trees is um, you know, a- absolutely incredible. Yeah, well, I'm definitely going to make sure we go and check out that one at Turum, the Leichhardt tree there. Love to see that. Now, I mentioned earlier the brass plate, the infamous brass plate. Now, if you know the story of Ludwig Leichhardt, you'll know in 1900, a brass plate was found that bared Leichhardt's name. It said Ludwig Leichhardt, 1848. And it was discovered by an Aboriginal stockman near Sturt Creek between the Tanami and the Great Sandy Deserts, just inside Western Australia from the border with the Northern Territory. Now, it was partially atta- it was attached to a partially burnt shotgun slung in a boab tree, which was engraved with the initial L. So did he make it into WA and hung his rifle in a tree? This is it. Like, who else would put their rifle in a tree? Like, and if the tree's got the L marked on it, if the 
if the L is a common theme, you know, that that was what he did when he blazed his trees, then yeah. it's, it's so, Even if you made it that far, that's pretty epic, isn't it? Oh, it is absolutely outstanding, particularly because that wasn't a straight line. You know, yep. the, the man has not cut a straight line across the continent there. He's he's traced a course to, I guess, uh, stay in the water, stay out of the most arid areas, although not that that's a particularly um, <laughs> hospitable location where he found the, where they found the rifle. But, yeah, it, it's incredible navigation skills, if nothing else, to have, to have made it that far. Now, it took until 2006 before that brass plate was actually authenticated. It was 15 centimetres by 2 centimetres from memory. But before it was authenticated, we could only speculate on the path that he took. Now, whether he put it there or some Aboriginals had, as people said, near the, the Maranoa River, you know, slaughtered the, the party and traded far and wide and the things ended up there. But then how did the L end up in the Boab tree? We'll never know. This is it. You know, it's suggesting that he was doing exactly what we thought he would do and follow that northern arc. I'll tell you what. It's a shame he never made it, but uh, and it's it's a real shame that we'll never know. Wouldn't it be amazing if one day someone finds a, a leather saddlebag with a perfectly preserved journal inside it? Oh, <laughs> happy days! Happy days. He was great. such a he was such a journaler. You know, there there would have been oh, of course that would be there somewhere. You know, and if 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 he was if the if the party was you know killed by Aboriginals and and everything ransacked, then you know possibly never to be found again. But you yeah, know, there well, may still be remnants of. Given that his uh, his shotgun they found was partially burnt, you don't hold out much hope, do you? But Not then, like you said, no. you never know. You never ever know. You know, people went back and found some of William Will's instruments from the Burke and Wills mm. uh, expedition. You know, hundreds of years on hundreds, but you know, over a hundred years later, they, they found that gear. Yeah. So you never know. Anything could happen. Someone and if he knew that he was for it, it, if they knew that they weren't getting out, like the, the malnutrition or whatever else, that, that journal may well be buried somewhere with yeah, what right. to him was a very obvious marking. You know, who knows? So you need to get out there and um, walk it with a metal detector, mate. Any uh, any volunteers? I'll, I'll take the quad bike. <laughs> yeah, I'm not big on walking either. I've got a figure to maintain. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so like a lot of explorers, Leichhardt has quite the legacy and he's had a bunch of stuff named after him over the years. Uh, there's the suburb in Sydney, of course, Leichhardt, which is a famous Italian district these days. Uh, there's an electoral division, I believe, in Queensland. There's the Leichhardt Highway, the Leichhardt River. You said you drove the Leichhardt Highway today? I did. And squillions of animals, fish, beetles, scorpions, millipedes, spiders, a snail, and even an earthworm. And a grasshopper. Yeah, the grasshopper and a leaf jumper, a whole bunch of stuff. Thrip, I don't even know what thrip is, but thrip was another one. <laughs> so, yeah, he, he did plenty. Beetles. There, there Absolutely. was six or seven different beetles. There was over 20 spiders named after him. Wow. It's bizarre. Lots and lots of stuff. Some scary yeah, he, spiders, he, too. <laughs> he is, you know, thankfully, I guess, one of the one of the Australian explorers that we do still see in the school curriculum to some extent. You know, he we do still see a reasonable amount about Ludwig Leichhardt, but I guess you can never do justice to the whole story. So I'm certainly looking forward in the coming years, Rico, to actually getting out and revisiting, you know, certainly well, it will get rerunning out there, the successful one, rerun we'll, the successful voyage, and then see what we can make of the, uh, of the second one. We'll get out there and see what we can find. Absolutely. Hmm. All right, mate, well, we're going to take a short break, and uh, on the other side, we're going to come back with the legend, the man himself, Mr. Ron Moon, who's going to run us through some of the things that you can do to go and uh, experience Leichhardt's country for yourself. How was your day, sweetie? Terrible. A deal that I've been working on for weeks felt... And yep. <sighs> Sounds like the time the gearbox went in my patrol. How is that the same, Terry? If you really love cars, Auto One. Auto One. All right, there you go. We're back now with the one, the only, the legend, Mr. Ron Moon. Oh, look at that. They love you. <laughs> uh, enough of the Mr. bit, mate. <laughs> <laughs> How are you, mate? How are you going? Yeah, good. Yeah, good. Um, we're still stuck in Victoria, but that's all right. Uh, we'll, we'll get out of here sooner or later. Yeah, let's hope so, mate. Let's hope so, because uh, I think we've all had enough of sitting at home, that's for sure. Yeah, that's for sure. It's going well, to be mate, a big um, touring year next year. <laughs> oh, isn't it just? Yeah, well, yeah, it might be a big one. This, the last half of this year was a bit of luck. Uh, yeah. I think our, our rural uh, towns will uh, like to see a few more visitors, that's for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, well, look, I'd love to be yeah. one of them. <laughs> yeah. So, Ron, mate, you've been uh, you've been massive on the explorer side of things for a long time, and, and look, it, it might be a little bit strange to, to hear it, but 
you've obviously been an inspiration to a lot of people when it comes to this sort of content, myself included. I've watched um, many, many of your DVDs and read many publications over the years. That's why I thought you'd be the perfect bloke to talk to about Ludwig Leichhardt yeah. and where he went. Yeah. yeah look, I mean, I've, I've always been a bit of a fan of following the Explorers. I guess it's because of my great-grandfather or followed, uh, he was with Sturt and uh, the 1844 expedition and then uh, my grandfather was uh, up riding, riding Pony Express on the Overland Telegraph line between Darwin and uh, and Adelaide and um, and my father was wandering around the Pacific and in India in the 1920s. So, you know, I've got, um, yeah, that sort of wanderlust in me, I think, and uh, and um, and the Explorers are, are sort of um, a, a great way to see the country. Yeah, that's right. Well, apart from Sturt, which I think might be the obvious one, what's your favourite story regarding Australian explorers? Uh, say again? Uh, disregarding Sturt, because of the obvious connection, what's what's your favourite Australian exploration story? Well, it's probably one that doesn't spring to mind um, uh, easily or, or with most pe- with most people. It's uh, it's the Jardine story of... Um, of their expedition uh, driving cattle up to the top of Cape York in the 1860s, yeah, and uh, we follow we follow that uh, we follow that uh, trip fairly closely um, back uh, a number of years ago, and had the great grandson of Frank Jardine with us and all that sort of stuff. And um, I mean, that was a fabulous, fabulous trip. And uh, when you look at um, you know Cape York and Kennedy uh, and Leichhardt for that for that uh, for that fact. Mm. Um, who all came to ha- have some form of grief on Cape York, um, the Jardines, and Frank Jardine was only 19 years old when he led the expedition up uh, up Cape York. Wow. Um, yeah, and um, he got through remarkably unscathed, although he had a few run-ins with, uh, with uh, people on the Mitchell River, exactly the same as Leichhardt did uh, when uh, he lost Gilbert. Yeah, well, there you go. Well, mate, talking about Leichhardt again, um I know that, that you've done a fair bit of travelling up around that part of the world. If if someone who's listening to this podcast decided that they wanted to go out, uh, they were inspired, they wanted to go and experience what Leichhardt experienced, where would you say is the best place to go? Well, well, I think I think you, you don't have to go far. I mean, I love following up the explorers, and uh, as, as you said, and uh, you, you only got to go out as far as Dolby, and uh, you know, not far out of Brisbane at all. And uh, up to Jimbor Station, and that's where he started um, his expeditions from. Because at that point in time, in 1844, it was the furthest out to European settlement. Now, Jimbor Station, if you look at the uh, uh, the homestead, I mean, it's an incredibly beautiful homestead, and uh, um, it was obviously wasn't uh, quite that well set up when uh, <laughs> when Kennedy set off, but. Uh, Today it's a it's a beautiful. Um, I think it's the only English style homestead in Queensland, and um, it's magnificent gardens, English style gardens, and all that sort of stuff. And they they were set up, you know, sort of about twenty or thirty years after um, after um, Leichhardt had uh, had set off there. But you can go there, and uh, of course around Dalby you got. Um, You've got the Bunya Mountains National Park and those incredible trees up there, which are a little bit different to anything else. And then you can head north up to uh, Peru, um, which um, has got a monument to um, Kennedy. In fact, I'm, I'm not too sure how many... Oh, Kennedy. Uh, to Leichhardt. Um, I'm not too sure how many monuments there are to Leichhardt around the place, but uh, there's one in, uh, one in uh, Tarum, which is uh, sort of uh, north a mile. In, in Queensland. Yeah, we spoke about a couple that uh, the monuments for Gilbert, who was obviously slain by the Aborigines. Uh, there was the one at Tarum and there's one at St James Church in Sydney. But no, I didn't really come across too much information about any monuments to Leichhardt either. Yeah, yeah. And of course, from there, he, you know, he went up to, uh, you know, he, he, he named uh, the expedition rangers and all that sort of stuff. And now that's uh, a lot of that area is a national park or... or uh, or a state forest and all that sort of stuff. So there's plenty of opportunities to camp and uh, and things up there, and which is really good. I mean, it's a ma- magic spot there. I haven't actually been up there for about uh, 20 years. I was wandering around up there a lot um, back 20 odd years ago, but I haven't been up there uh, uh, in uh, in recent times. And 
sort of bypass that area and, and go head further north to uh, the places around the Gulf and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, I still get to visit country. that area pretty uh, pretty often actually. Then there is, you know, all those little towns, all those little reaches of the river, like the Condamine and all the various other places. They've all got a story. You know, they were all yeah off points. They were the last bastion of civilization for many people, and um, yep. yeah, it is. There is still a ton of. I guess I could plenty of work up in there with all of the the mining explorations been going on. Um, yep. So I've, I've been able to uh, spend a bit of time in that region. So I've actually just found a whole heap of photos of Jimbo House from my last trip up there, Rico. I'll um, send them your way and get them up on the website, I reckon. Yeah, that'll be great. Yeah, look, I think, I, I mean, if you're interested in following up on, on this expedition, I mean, that's a great place to start. I mean, oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> phenomenal. I mean, it's a beautiful home set. And um, to think it has that link back to um, the Leichhardt, it's just fantastic. Ron, and, have you. Uh, um, and then you can. Have you managed to, to get up to Port Essington yourself and have a look around there? To where? Port Essington? No, no, no. No, me either. I've seen some uh, I've seen some footage of it and it looks like an incredibly inhospitable place. Yeah. Look, I mean some of the places these guys went when you consider uh, you know uh, what was out there and all that sort of stuff and they were I mean Leichhardt was a, a rather interesting character. I'm sure you've talked about him and um, how different he was yeah. to a lot of people. I mean, he, he was referred to as a doctor, but um, that's a little bit hazy in, in the history of all this sort of thing. And he certainly didn't come from an exploring back, background, but he had this inquisitive uh, nature about him. But he also had uh, other foibles about his, uh, his, his uh, nature and all that sort of stuff. So... Uh, an interesting bloke um, to to, uh, to to read about and to follow. Yes, yeah, certainly. And look, he didn't he achieve a lot? And it's we we're saying it's such a shame that uh, we never really will find out the truth about what actually happened to him and how far yeah. he went. Yeah. Well, where, where do you reckon uh, he ended up? Well, I got to say, I, I think uh, you know the, the the latest research I think has shown that. Uh, uh, that rifle butt um, has been found out in uh, out around the Sturt River, uh, Sturt Creek, in um, in the Western Australia, south of the Kimberley. And um, I'm trying to think of the guy who who wrote the book. Uh, where's Dr. Leichhardt? Or, or I think that's the name of the book. Where Where is Dr. Leichhardt? And um, and um, he, he puts up a fairly compelling uh, sort of story about all the all the theories that came out about Leichhardt, and um, that one sort of has some um, some credence, I've got to say. And the Australian National Museum or the National Library bought the, the rifle butt, which was found uh, on Sir uh, on Sir Creek. Now, whether the expedition went across the top of Australia like Leichhardt said he would, and then picked up a uh, up Sir Creek. But that was flowing, you know, I mean, it's a beautiful, beautiful area, especially when it's got water and that flows into, uh, you know, Lake Gregory and all that sort of stuff. And it's fantastic when you're out there and it has been flooded. And I've been out there a few times like that. And you could imagine some explorer hitting that creek, that third creek, um, and then pushing south, you know, thinking that this is going to lead me to, uh, to Perth and, uh, and southern Western Australia. And then all of a sudden it peters out in the desert. Um, yeah, you can maybe almost his, you can almost uh, picture him hanging the rifle where he ended up. up. You can almost hey? picture him hanging the rifle up and just sitting down and taking <laughs> stock of where he is and and what he's been through yeah. to get there. Yeah, whether it got there like that or it was traded through Aboriginal groups and ended up there, you know, that's a possibility, I guess. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, look, it's it, it's phenomenal. But I mean, <laughs> I'll be three expeditions that the. the the first one was his most successful, you got to say. Yeah, well, he actually made it home, so that's a cracker. <laughs> Great start. <laughs> which, is, which is always a good thing, mate. Yeah, well, we were talking about that earlier, and we mentioned the fact that it took him something like 13 months to do the 5,000 Ks from the Darling Downs up to Port Essington. And the second trip yeah. where he, he sort of had the false start to, to get across to the west, he was gone for six months and had only travelled 800 Ks and was near death. Yeah, just goes to show yeah. how tough it is out there, no matter how much knowledge you've amassed over the years. I often um, I think about this story and I wonder, had he grown up uh, you know, in this sort of a country rather than 
you know, the upbringing that he had in Europe, would he would he have been better equipped to deal with uh, with the Australian in land country? Yeah, well, yeah, there you go. I mean, who knows? I mean, I mean, getting back to getting back to his first trip, and um, you know, he, he sort of wandered up inland um, uh, through central uh, Queensland, I guess you got to say, and uh, some beautiful country in there, and it's a really pleasant country to travel through, and all that sort of stuff. And I must admit, I haven't followed uh, Leica up through that area per se, but I've been up there plenty of times. And of course, you end up um, on the Burdekin and the, around the Burdekin Dam and uh, the Sutto River and uh, and all that sort of stuff, um, uh, which is beautiful country. And then um, up through Ravenswood and out past um, um, Charters Towers, a fabulous little town, I reckon. Uh, I love Charters historically Towers. Historically and all yep. that sort of stuff. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. And again, that whole that whole Gulf Savannah region, you know, just lent itself. I guess you know, it, it there was water, and there and there wasn't in other places, you know, and that would have, yeah. like, you know, for for many, it would have been the the rainbow that they were looking for, wasn't it? You yeah, know, this this was how they were going to open up the inland, and um, and for many, it it didn't turn, it didn't quite turn out that way. Yeah, well, of course, I mean, he went through that beautiful country north of Charter South. Fairly rugged country too, you got to say. And uh, um, um, I, I've been up there hunting uh, up around on Bluff Downs and all through that area. And of course, that that at that area has uh, um, that's where the Hahn brothers um, sort of started off. You know, the Hahns of uh, Cape York and the, mm. the Hahns of um, Western Australia. So um, they started off at Bluff Downs, and their parents' graves are, are on uh, Bluff Downs. So. It's um it's a really historic area, and then of course north of there is where um what a, uh, what did uh, like I call it um valley of um valley of um valley of the lagoon, okay. and um and that sort of um uh you know bloody beautiful country. There's plenty of camping up there too. It's um, really nice country to go and camp and all that sort of stuff. Fairly popular with uh, townsville folks and all that sort of stuff, but uh, um. You're sort of uh, east of um, Batandara Volcanic uh, National Park. Yeah, which is another amazing location. Yeah. Yep. Oh, yeah, fantastic. So there's plenty to see. Yeah, you know, if you if you sort of go, well, let's follow Leichhardt up there. I mean, you can you can follow these uh, explorers and and have so many other things to have a look at along the way. You know, just one of the one of the things that they mightn't have seen. You know, a lot of the places and all that sort of stuff, but uh, you you follow their route up through uh, up through um, in this case um, Queensland, and uh, you get to see all these incredible places. I mean, it's just fantastic. Yeah, it's some stunning country out yeah. there. I um, I said to Dingo Dave earlier. I, I wish that I knew more about the geology of this country um, because when you go up through those regions, you mentioned the volcanic national park and. You know, you come across places like that that just seem to be a, a strange anomaly, and I'd love to understand them a lot better. Yeah, yeah. I'm a bit sick when it comes to geology and botany and all that sort of stuff. I've got to be hit over the head with a brick to get anything to sink <laughs> in. But, but <laughs> yeah, uh, a rock's would, a rock. Would, would that be a sedimentary brick <laughs> or a, <laughs> something else? <laughs> I tell you what, mate, I would have been useless to go out gold fossil or something like that back in the old days with a hammer and hammer and pick. <laughs> oh, that was some hard work too. Yeah. All right, mate. Well, uh, thank you very much for for your insight. Look, when we go and do Ludwig Leichhardt's trip, we'll we'll certainly extend an invitation. We'd love you to join us if you're able to. We'd have a great time, I think. Yeah. Look, uh, uh, one of the things that uh, really intrigues me is uh, is Gilbert's grave. Now that has that was discovered by. Um, a professor out of um, Townsville, um, James Cook University, uh, back about 30, 40 years ago. Um, he, he reckons he found the site. Wow. And, um, and uh, that's on the, uh, on the Mitchell River where the Nasa River sort of um, you know, flows out. You know what those floodplains are like out in the Gulf Country. They all coalesce into, into one big sea when, um, when the uh, when the floods are in and the wet seasons are roaring and all that sort of stuff, so there's a monument put out there by the army back in the mid 1980s. It'd be lovely to find that again, that's for sure. Yeah, just another place to put on the ever growing list uh, of must visit yeah. spots. <laughs> we never make the list shorter, Rico. No, <laughs> well. no, well that's that's right. Yeah, I'm sort of uh, 
as the older I get, my list uh, of places I want to go to and things I want to do just keep getting longer. Yeah, that's it. Well, How does just, that work? Just got to make plans, mate, not excuses. That's my theory, so that's the way we'll do it. Look, mate, if people want to check you out on Facebook, they can go to Ron and Viv Moon's Remote Australia, jump on there and give that a like. You're still doing some work with 4x4 Australia, mate? Yeah, yeah, still do a bit of work for them and do a bit of video work for them and all that sort of stuff. And, uh, yeah, we've got our Facebook page and Instagram and all those sorts of stuff. Yeah, and Trent's, that Trent's doing some tours as well. And filling the time with, and and hopefully we'll be out uh, out in the bush uh, as soon as the gate as soon as the gates open. Yeah, we can't wait. And Trent's running some tours as well. Is that right? Okay, mate. No worries at all. Okay, obviously missing that one. Not a problem, mate. We'll um, okay. we'll chat soon. All righty. All right, we seem to have lost Ron there, but we're going to wind things up. Look, if you'd like to know more, make sure you check us out on Facebook. You can go to Rico 4x4 and check me out there. You can also go to Dingo Dave's page by typing in Dingo Dave 4x4. And also don't forget to check out Ron's page as well, Ron Moon or Ron and Viv Moon's Remote Australia. To find out more about the Tag Along Tours that we run, head to my Facebook, uh, not my Facebook, my website at rico.com.au. You'll find out plenty of information there about some of the stuff that we've got coming up just as soon as we're allowed back out. We hope to see you guys out there on the track soon. We'll see you out there. Cheers, guys.